Well, whatever. Whatever you <laughs> <laughs> um, So Federica asked me to start, and um, I don't know how to start in a way. Um, obviously, kind of, one thing I'd like to say is that this is the first time I feel like I've done a show as an artist. I'm not quite sure what I was before. I was a kind of meta artist, doing works that were perhaps kind of stories, but they weren't works. So this is the first show, you know, you are at my inaugural show, which is kind of a strange thing. But also a lot, you know, <coughs> Federico and I have had many conversations outside this formal space. And I was also looking back at the things that kind of I really wanted to discuss and ask you publicly because it's, you know, it is a kind of public space. And, you know, there are a couple of things. For example, um, you know, we're talking about time. And maybe I'll just sum up of the main things and you can kind of enter this. We can enter this as a conversation and everybody else. There's, there's some crucial things about these works. One is to do with being outside time. And this is something that you talk about in relation to the prophet, which I'm not claiming to be, but it's that thing of being outside time, outside contemporary. And I was having last night a conversation with my friend John about that also coming from a Gambon... Uh, yeah, what's contemporary? What's, yeah. Yeah, time is contemporary. So there's that. There's also my particular interest and a shared interest, I think, in the Baroque and repetition and the idea of... Um, a kind of self-contained autonomous space that Baroque creates, the idea of chamber, but also, and maybe this is where something will start, why don't we start with the Baroque, it's a kind of random point, but let's start with the Baroque. And I was listening um, to something you talked about, and also in a written interview, and I really like this idea that the Baroque and Tiepolo's paintings and the kind of the pinks and the blues, this being the last moment of happiness in Europe, which is maybe we're past that moment, well past. And this is really important to me. Um, and I realise that this is something that is happening with this work. The only reason why I think I'm kind of currently alive um, is... Um, you talk about the pigment of happiness in Tiepolo and the, this kind of period in painting but, and in maybe music too, being a wildly optimistic desire, this is your words, wildly optimistic desire for happiness with a pessimistic understanding of the fleetingness of life. So I kind of like that idea that perhaps, <coughs> like being in this, I'm wildly optimistic. I have a wildly optimistic desire for happiness, and it's the realization of the fleetingness of life. And you talk in this interview also about the fact that where we are at now, why when we use pink now, which I hope I'm not doing, is it's like a it's a parody. And in fact, what we want to do is prolong life, but have no desire for happiness. So I want to be in the place where I have a wildly optimistic desire for happiness, with a pessimistic understanding of the fleetingness mm -hmm. of life. <laughs> well, can I start by asking you, so when, when you chose pink, yeah. why was that? Um, I chose pink actually quite randomly, which is that I've, I wanted to use materials that already existed in the world. So a lot of these works, um, well all of them, are made with these kind of um, vintage, if you like, pigments. So I bought uh, things from the 1960s American pastels and you know Polish 1970s and it's amazing actually the you know cultural differences you have these bright things all perfectly preserved from America and broken green and brown things from Poland uh, that, the, so, you know reality of life anyway but um, so they were quite run, random but it, it, it was maybe a channeling a certain thing the way I started to use color was very in a way random but that it was derived just from the choices that pr were presented to me in these boxes but then as I, you know, these are very highly worked works and it was a kind of channeling of perhaps that desire. I mean, they, they are kind of desire filled. Mm. Anyway, so that, so that it was a random choice, but pink did something. It, it um, and 
but only fluorescent. I only mainly use fluorescent just because it comes from a certain time. So it's more like a kind of time channeling idea. Yeah, I think when we think of pink in Baroque, it's, uh, it's also inside the context when it was used. Because <coughs> it was a, a pretty tough time, mm. uh, politically especially, um, pandemics, wars of religion. But the, the environment when where that took place, mm. had a certain idea of the world as, as a theater, as a representation. So on the one hand, you had a very realistic sense of uh, life as decay, life as going towards death, this lurking abyss underneath everything. And on the other, this optimistic idea that it was possible to uh, float over the abyss. Yeah. In a sense. Which is, yeah, <laughs> this kind of like this uh, lack of background. But the lack of background in, in the Baroque was a bit different because there was more of a sense of this background being dark. And so uh, the, re the response to that was not despair. It was an idea of trying to find um, yeah, floating mechanisms. Mm. So the pink, the music, is an attempt to do that. I think that is wise in the sense that in the face of the inevitability of decay, um, you can either fall into complete despair or try somehow to, to waltz over it. It's kind of similar to what you have, I think, at the beginning of the 20th century in Austria, mm. where there is a general sense of decay. We were talking earlier, we talked about uh, you know, a sense of decay also in Britain at the moment, you know, this feeling that things are sliding downwards, which is just a normal thing, you know, like it happens in history, especially if you're flying pretty high for a while, then you have that feeling. Um, mm. And then you are, you are kind of have to try to uh, redeem this decay. If you are a policy maker, you try to do it with politics. Um, if you are a cultural producer, sometimes you try to intervene politically, but sometimes you try to, I think, to give a, a therapeutic solution, especially to those who don't have the power to transform the material circumstances of life. And, and <clears throat> you can give this redemption not in the form of a hope, so mm. hope in the sense of like, you're hoping that something will eventually happen afterwards, but in the sense of an instant redemption, that those in immediate circumstances in which you find ourselves can be interpreted in a different way. So I think mm. in, in that sense we can see the Baroque to us today, maybe not in the intention of the people there, which we will have to speak with them, so we, we can only project about, uh, about that, but in the way in which we utilize that, the, that work, I think it gives us this, um, solution, uh, which is similar to, like, I don't know, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, for example, so thinking of uh, the late period in the, in the Austrian, Austro-Hungarian Empire. I said that I think that is wise, because um, <laughs> also as a political move, as a political move, I think you have, on the one hand, to have future-oriented solutions that try to, um, you know, have the, the bright sun of tomorrow, as they used to say, in, in the communist environment in the 20th, uh, 19th century, but also you have to uh, consider that between now and the bright sun, sun of tomorrow, <coughs> which might never yeah. rise, between now and then, there will be a period of time where there will be no sun. So what do you do when, mm. in the period of time when there is no sun? In the period of time in which the only possibility is technically defeat, as in non-victory. Non yeah. mm. Trying to redeem it, in a sense, and culturally, I think makes a massive difference, especially, paradoxically, um, for, the, for those who are defeated by history. So that was my, my real fascination with the Baroque, the last breath of happiness. Right. It's yeah. very different from the kitsch, which is a different Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, it's not kitsch. Because yeah. the kitsch has to do with, uh, I think, more of a, a kind of like nihilistic uh, acceptance of darkness and, the, and disgregation and acceptance of the meaninglessness of everything. But the, the pink of the Baroque is more an understanding that even though nothing makes sense even though by itself there is darkness you still have the one power you have is to redeem it mm. so not to change it not to anything but just to redeem it which is a very peculiar intervention i think in the present but i think it's for me also it's that that the the repetition in baroque music which is i'm very very interested in because obviously i found a space with these words where i can repeat something and difference um so there's difference and repetition, and that's not going to Deleuze, but it's kind of, it's every time I make this, there is another thing that has been made. So in a sense, it's that looping where you pick up bits on the way, you know, the kind of the Baroque curve. 
but but literally but on a, in a physiological way there's that interests me also how the emotional be, can be achieved through the technical and this is something i know that i've kind of questioned and sort of raised when we met in the studio which is that i'm really interested where emotions can be kind of can be had say from 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 like a physical reaction so um i don't know when you listen to a my like a bach or, mar or kind of some baroque chords where they go into a minor key you feel sad but you don't quite know why because it's not that it's a romantic sadness mm -hmm. it's actually a physiological reaction and in the same way that um you know when you listen to drum and bass and when something so a note comes on and it's just ecstatic so it's both a physical reaction plus obviously content repetition the idea of having a long-term project is uh, fictitious you know you you never really get to the next time in the same in the same way that you are always working for tomorrow but tomorrow never comes yeah it's a typical experience of people that have this um, postponement of, of uh, um, pleasure, you know, so I keep working so one day I will be able to, to rest and they, that day will never, never happen, okay? So you're always stuck in the repetition. And so the achievement of the project is impossible, but the, the thing that directs your repetition is the desire. So the, the, the kind of like uh, direction towards a, a project that you will never achieve. That direction moves you in one way or another. But there's also a kind of what, which is what I like in Baroque music, or what what I'm, why this work is working for me, is because um, there is a sort of degree of instant gratification. You, the, the chord, the minor chord, comes immediately, mm -hmm. so you know it's coming and it comes, and then it, and then another one. So you know the repetition is there for you to work with, as opposed to always kind of looking for the proscenium arch, the point, the vanishing point. There is no vanishing point, in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of anti-perspectival, mm -hmm. because perspective means you're always trying to get to the point, which is in Deleuze, obviously. But then, um, but then you try to, you know, you try to get there, you never do. But actually, if you're constantly <coughs> repeating something and you still have the instant hit, then the repetition is working for you, as opposed to just an endless sense of failing. I think it's quite similar in a way what you, what you find in, in mystical and ecstatic literature. Um, the mystic has a desire to unite with the divinity. I mean, I'm saying the divinity because even just talking of God in mystical literature is incorrect, mm -hmm. beyond that. Of course, that desire is impossible to achieve because you Either it's irrelevant because you already are part of it, or it's impossible because if there is a distance, it's unbridgeable. And yet, feeling the desire is already an instant hit. And yeah, when absolutely. When you really totally embrace the desire, it's excellent. So in, in a sense, that's that. you find that in Sufi literature, for example, when you talk about, which is, in, especially in, in Persian and Shia version of Sufism, the, the metaphor is, uh, is a nightingale on a rose. And as he approaches the rose, the, the thorn pierces his heart. Mm. And so it's that kind of like agony and, and, and love and ecstasy all united in one. It's really impossible to achieve it. But even just moving towards it is, is an instant ecstatic experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I think that also kind of relates to being that ecstatic experience. And this is going to my kind of my other point that I wanted to ask you is this idea of being out of time um, which is also to do with an ecstatic experience which is that um, the and it but it is also a return to a place and picking up on the thing you said about dreams um, I really go to the same place I've got places I've got places I go to they're, they're really good I mean I really I can't wait to go to bed because I'm looking forward to these places can't always get that my daughter actually now has a dream rabbit companion wow. and she says the rabbit is with her every time and it's really and she said I mean occasionally she said no rabbit wasn't there but but mostly <laughs> the rabbit is there and I go to I have a particular geography there's a really amazing place that I fly over it's really good plus um, I do a lot of flying in dreams like loads it's really good I'm really good at flying, like I've really got the technique, it's really perfect. And, um, and then, so, 
So there's a place that you can fly over, the flyover. There's a flyover and it's all mountains. It's really, I mean, it's phenomenal. So I don't often get there, but I now kind of gear myself to going there. So yes, um, but it's obviously being out of the continuum of time. I don't know where these places are, but they really are pretty real. You know, and I, my flight really good. I mean, I'm almost ready, like almost, I'm almost ready actually. Um, but so yeah, so but but that being out of time um, is kind of it's also the chamber, the 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 space you go to, and by that I don't really mean oh you know I'm in the studio in my ecstatic time. It's not that, but it's a different physical reality, the production, and yeah, but the flying is is better actually. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, with time, we we enter a, a huge. Uh, metaphysical topic and mm. it can get very technical on the one hand but it also it can remain very confusing and uh, inconclusive on the other hand like something Saint Augustine used to say time is that thing that if you don't ask me what it is I know very well the moment you ask me to explain it I don't know anymore what it yeah. is um, but there is one thing about time which is I think <coughs> quite uh, possible to discuss that is it's, it's, a, it's aspect of being a form of counting Time is defined as a form of, of counting, of measuring, and not only that, so that already implies somebody counting, but it's a way of counting in relation to something else. So you count, you count time in relation to the movement of the stars, of the sun, uh, the, the cycle of seasons. Or, for example, clocks um, count time in reference to their own movement, or in reference to the movement of another clock. Um, so I think the, the question of being in, inside and outside of time is interesting because on the one hand it, for as human beings it seems I mean I'm not as decisive as Kant in my conclusion but it seems that we are stuck inside of time so it seems that time is one of those things that we need to be able to make sense and enjoy and flourish in life mm -hmm. on the other hand if we think about it a moment we realize that time has a fictional quality to it so it's not something that is out there. So dealing with time in, it requires, I think, a, an interesting, um, almost literary quality. On the one hand, you have to be able to handle this fiction in order to, to enter it. On the other hand, you should not be overwhelmed by it and taken over entirely and believe it entirely. You have to, I think, maintain a certain distance from it. That distance positions you somewhere outside of time but also in between times. So it's mm. a bit like in, in Epicurus, there's infinite worlds and there's the intermundia, which are the spaces in between worlds where the gods live. Okay. And he also yeah. asks the gods live there and they don't care about you, so don't, don't, don't care about that. But, um, so I think that's quite useful to have this constant reshuffling into space between times because it frees you in, in part. Yes, from, it completely frees you. It is yeah, it is. It's, it's a kind of liberation. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think, in, uh, for example, in contemporary art, there is a risk in contemporary art of being contemporary, as in of coinciding with your own time, to, to the point in which it becomes difficult to step outside of it. Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to step outside yeah. of it. I, That's I how you were no... saying that your work is not contemporary. Well, you were saying that. But it is coming at that, no, I don't. But, um, so, um, I, yeah, the, the being outside of it, but it's, it's sort of, I mean, the measuring is also interesting and counting because you kind of count segments and again, obviously time is a repetition, you know what I mean, it's, it's, it's the thing you count, it's patterns, it's rhythms and, you know, it's in music, it's, it's, it's counting. And I suppose I kind of I have been thinking about that idea of counting, but also the fi I mean, fictional time is really an important thing. I, I, will, I always like that French Revolution thing of having a decimal clock, mm. you know, because it's such a random thing. Yeah. But also a move in terms of production, a move, you know, in terms of your labour. That it people used to make one basket an hour, and it was worth a certain amount. Once you have a mechanical production. An hour is the labor because the machine makes ten baskets in an hour, mm -hmm. so it, your time becomes kind of mechanized so I mean it, it raises all sorts of things about your time, other people's time, mechanical time, but I think in relation to the being outside it, it's actually 
really, really difficult, particularly in contemporary society, to run not with the with time, to run not on this kind of yeah. the, the regulatory system which we have to adhere to, and to be outside it, it becomes an incredible luxury. It's like the luxury of the rich. Mm. I mean, it's it's interesting, and being outside of time is a kind of like a fanciful thing. But I think not not even. But I, I think you should fight for it. You see, I, I really that you know proper time and the title, even yeah. though it comes from um, physics and mathematics and vectors on a point independently. But I also thought about proper time being a kind of impossibility of spending proper time. But these works for me are my proper time, my real, actual, physical engagement. So I do think you have to fight for proper time. Yeah, but also. I mean, I was thinking also when you were saying that, yeah, stepping outside of time is really the ultimate privilege, especially mm. today. Yeah. I don't think that, I mean, most privileges are related to class. Some of them, are, I think, might not be. Like, for example, this one, I don't, I don't, don't think know. that even, the, even the, the rich necessarily are able to step outside of time. Yeah, not all. No, yeah. I think in the sense of, like, it depends also on the metaphysical outlook that you have. Um, if we step outside, the space outside of time is, is called is eternity, fundamentally. Okay? So outside of time there is only eternity, which is different from infinity. And in a sense, like the way in which we understand time today, for example, goes towards infinity rather than eternity. So even if you are super rich, but maybe you, you're not philosophically inclined, uh, you might still remain stuck with infinity. Just, just to explain a moment the, mm -hmm. how I see the difference. Um, when we measure time, we measure time in a way that implies infinite repetition and infinite stretching. It's a bit of the line, you know, with no beginning and no end. That is the infinite counting. Of course, that is a, an abstract idea because it, it, it would require a counter that can run infinitely. But, you know, it, it is an abstract idea that goes forever. And that's how we understand time today. Stepping outside of time means stepping to a position in which the, the counting is abolished and the, the series is interrupted. You don't find that space any point along the line. You find it outside of the line. Now, in the way in which we understand the structure of the universe at the moment, so like the common, common sense metaphysics, there is no place outside of the line. There is no place outside of the infinite stretch of space. There is no space outside of the infinite stretch of time. I think we reflect this, for example, also in architecture, uh, in the sense that uh, when you have modular buildings, yeah. when you look at them, the thing I, I, when I feel a bit nauseous with that kind of architecture is because I see that they could stretch indefinitely. There is no particular reason why they stop at the 15th floor or at 200 meters length. They could continue indefinitely. That implies this feeling of being stuck inside this infinite. Repetition because time. you can't, st there is no param there's, there's no, no outside. There's no outside, yeah. But Palladio's architecture, to, to go back to, uh, to Renaissance instead, with the idea of a, of, a con of a concluded proportion within, implies that the observer is somehow outside <coughs> of that and can visualize a fiction uh, that has concluded forms mm -hmm. and is not imprisoned within this. So it has one, one foot in eternity and one foot in time. I think this is um, generally lacking today. Completion, in a sense. Both things, like freedom from time and the possibility of, of uh, seeing a completion. Uh, and I think, for example, in your work, it is present on the other completion. hand. Completion? Or, or things. both things, both, okay. Yeah, both, both completion and the possibility of stepping outside. Mm. The, the problem is that if you lack that, um, you're in a strange situation. On the one hand, you're fully imprisoned, so you have no outside. But on the other, you're incredibly fragile because you are trapped inside this, this, this infinite counting of space and time that determines you entirely, okay? The moment that series kicks you off for some reason, you disappear. Mm. The idea of having one foot in eternity means that even if that series is interrupted for whatever reason, whatever happens there, you still exist. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, that existence is really, yeah, that's, yeah. But how do you do it? <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's it's the it's the existing outside, and then, and I think that, I mean, I think a lot of it is also a kind of technological continuum, because one of the reasons, I mean, I I started this work in isolation in lockdown, I mean, not entire isolation, but kind of, 
um, and very difficult circumstances. And but actually, it made me think: if there was nothing, what would I have? So it's a kind of self-sufficiency, not to say that it's a kind of isolationism or a self-sufficiency in the American, you know, what's where they go, survivalist, survivalist term. <laughs> I'm not a survivalist, but, but, it, but it's a kind of survival, which you think it could be this, but it could be something else. And once this is completed, I could do another one. It, it, there is this, it's a different way of it's a, it's a kind of independency, I suppose, that I'm really interested in, and an autonomy. An autonomy can't, and that doesn't mean autonomy without friends, it's kind of autonomy with friends, but it means that you um, are not, I think that trapped inside a sort of continuum is, is, is maybe I wasn't able to articulate that before, but it's also being trapped with um, technology. Um, and I, again, I'm not anti-technology, but if you're completely within it, then you can't be outside it. And I think if you have no autonomy within production or within your life, then it's very, very difficult. It's kind of a psychological breakdown. And I think, I, I mean, it's interesting that you're using these two terms, autonomy and survival. Mm. Um, and they're not good. I don't no, like no, I them. That, I think they're perfect because they remind me of, of, a, of a 19, like late 1970s debate that, that was in Italy, in the autonomous. Well, movement. I was reading, since me, I started reading about the autonomous movement, yeah. And they were very much against survival. Mm. In the sense that, for example, the autonomous movement, 1977, Bologna in particular, and there was this kind of like anarcho situationist, they called it Mao Dadaist, kind of like type of insurrection, um, which also had um, fringes in the armed struggle as well, so it was a bit of a strange galaxy. But um, what one uh, group we incited was the so called aristocratic movement. They were anarchists, of course, left wing anarchists, and they were saying, we are, aristocratic, we are, we are a, a aristocratic movement against survival. Because the idea was, let's say, it's a more of a Dadaist version of bread and roses. The point is not to remain alive on a material level, the point is to have a dignified life. But um, I, I think survival, I mean, I don't mean beyond one's life, I don't mean, maybe it's, I think survival's the wrong world. It's more having the roses, it's, it's more the desire for happiness, is that's what I mean. So survival, I strike that off my vocabulary. I didn't, I mean survival more in terms of how you are and how you want to exist in the world. Yeah. Um, and actually all, the autonomous movement is really interesting because of this, um, that idea of fighting for time in oh, a yeah. way and the slowing down of things and the fact that they kind of, um, what's the, it's, um, there's a term they used which is um, where you basically slow down at work Oh, yeah. You sort of don't accelerate, in a sense, or you don't complete things, or... Eliza's watching me really good. <laughs> 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 I'm learning, my piece. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm learning. Yeah, no, they were very much against, against Labour in particular. Uh, Franco Berardi Bifo famously was the kind of like leading figure in, in the struggle against Labour. And it's interesting also because that struggle came out from a particular transformation in the productive forces when the, the factory workers were no longer uh, kind of like a proud and native class that they used to be, but they became an immigrant class. People from mm -hmm. southern Italy, like my family, you know, moving to the north and being an economically deported in the sense that you have to move because of the circumstances, mm -hmm. and not because of your particular condition. Uh, and then finding themselves in these factory environments and refusing to, to comply. You know? Yeah. Uh, they, they became this whole mass worker. Anyway, but that's the, but but one of the one of the aspects of that which I think is interesting in terms of uh, in reference to time is that, for example, when we think today of American um, post-apocalyptic films, the whole point of it like the survivalists, the whole challenge of it is to remain alive. And for the species to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Which is sometimes when I look at it, I'm like, who cares? Why, why, would you want, like, why would you want in a world that's been destroyed by a uh, general nuclear war, why would you want to continue? Mm. But there is, I think this is part, once again, of a certain metaphysical outlook in which what there is is this only this infinite line of repetition of one. You know, there's only one dimension in the world which is the measurable dimension of time and space which is this infinite prison, you are that, fundamentally. Deep down, human nature has to do, or whatever, like the nature of living things has to do with its 
uh, desire to remain alive infinitely. So your mission or is, or your fundamental desire is to survive. But once you can step outside, mm. you realize that the point is not to remain infinitely surviving. The point is something else, you know, like you enter that series for a reason. So you remain alive for a reason, for an aesthetic reason, uh, for a reason of pleasure, you can say it in many different ways. And then you start challenging the idea of survival. Well, also going back to that, you know, the original quote I had from, from you, which is that idea that you do realize the fleetingness of life, and there's actually nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And I think, and I, I mean, I guess then it, we do go back to more kind of then esoteric or Buddhist traditions, which are completely based on that idea that you don't try desperately to cling on to something. You know, you you make this and then it goes away, and that's also interestingly does connect to completion because you're not trying to be inside this thing, you're quite happy for this thing to be over. And then, then uh, yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, that I is know. the Buddhist tradition, um, which I respect very much, but I, I am unable to follow, personally. I mean, as a, as a good old Catholic boy from, from, from <laughs> Southern Italy, you know, there, there, is a, I, there is also another possi possible approach to that, in the sense that it may be a little bit less demanding in terms of your ability. Um, being able to let go is the aim, uh, mm. it's quite difficult, I find. Mm -hmm. There is another possibility which is, I think, that of self-compassion, in the sense that you still cling on to things, mm. and you do, um, I mean, maybe it's also the smoker speaking, like in the sense <laughs> that like, you have a sort of addictive relationship with something, and you know it's stupid, you know what I mean? But at the, you do it, but at the same time, you know it's stupid, and you don't hate yourself for it, but you accept it, because that has to do with the, the limitations of you being a sort of like, um, in as much as you are yourself in the world, in as, in as much as you are this character that is you in the world with your limitations and so on, you behave that way mm -hmm. and you forgive yourself for that. And that, whether you cling on it too much on it or not, it doesn't matter because anyway it's fleeting. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you do to yourself is to kind of like forgive yourself and slowly help yourself to understand that your clinging is only a game because it's impossible. Okay, so, so I think there's a, a kind of like a, a possible emotional modulation of that that is maybe less demanding than the yeah. the Buddhist approach, and mm -hmm. that is similar to the Baroque. Yes, once again, going back. which is the limitation or the or the rep yeah the desire or yeah. the repetition. It's of also something. an element of, of the redemption as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like redeeming the flaws, not correcting them. But it's very interesting for me because I'm not a good Catholic girl, or I'm not anything. <laughs> I'm you know, not and I think I, no, no, but but I, I have not. You know, personally, I you know my father is a secular Jew, and my mother is an you know being Russian is a kind of tri his I don't know communist. So no religion was in my family. But it's very interesting then to then now in the world we are in to think about how you operate in terms of making stuff and and just just functioning and I've always obviously looked at religions in you know theoretically I've always been interested but I haven't have no background have no basis in anything so then you are always sort of slightly outside of everything and kind of you've got nowhere to go mm -hmm. I have nowhere to go there's nothing I don't know it's like you just you're just stuck with nowhere to go in some way, but that also produces a desire to then um, find. I'm not saying that this is religious at all, but it's the outside time chamber autonomy that kind of is the. And again, I, I won't use the word survival. Is the kind of desire for happiness, I suppose. Yeah, but. Um what you think makes me think of, of something in particular um, related to religion, and maybe also to some aspect of, of your of your work. Um, to, to remain for a second in, in the idea that somehow we find ourselves being alive in the world, and we we don't entirely coincide with ourselves. You, know, you mm -hmm. wake up as Margarita, and but well, you could wake up as a rabbit or as anything else. I wish you you kind of like wake up as as embodying a certain character, which is you okay? mm -hmm. and, and I myself and, and all of us. This implies there is a little distance, you know, like there is a little distance between you and yourself, and you kind of like accompany this character, which is you throughout your throughout your life. May I add something? Uh, yes, one second. I'll, I'll finish this because I, I'll forget. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and in a way, like, so 
the thing that is in, inside you, you can call it the Atman if you want to use a Hindu terminology or whatever it is, accompanies this character which is you throughout your life. And, and you try to counsel yourself and advise yourself all the time and to make this experience of this character mm -hmm. for which you might find compassion, for example, is what I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, and you try to, to guide it. Uh, and that is usually philosophy. Okay? Philosophy is the, is the way in which you try to guide, to guide your character through the challenges of life. And to be honest, you love your character very much, for various reasons. It's one of those strange relationships, it's kind of like love, but also you know, a bit sick of it after a while. But, you know. And then it's, philosophy is like an amorous discourse, you know, like a lover's discourse with yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. But inside the world. And then I think there are some moments like in, in loving discourses where there is that blissful moment in which you realize all the limitations of the other, all the limitations of yourself, the impossibility of really being together or really achieving anything and then you accept it anyway. That ecstatic moment, the moment of silence. And I think that moment of silence in the amorous discourse is religion. Mm. Okay, religion is that moment in which you and your character are together and achieve a moment of silence. And I think when you were, we were talking about your work, mm -hmm. for example, this, you were talking about the perfect moment. Yeah, okay? uh, yeah, yeah. At a moment of silence in a certain way. I think that qualifies it already as religious work. It doesn't have to be denominational or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, but in the kind of like the way I'm suggesting to, to see it, in the way that you deal with yourself that you paint at night. You, you yeah, know, no, no, that. that's an, yeah, complete, yeah. 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 Or, the, or the moment of, perf of balance, which is only I understand. And yeah. we were talking about that thing of the balance that, that it's absolute, it's that's it. And it, it is a kind of ecstatic moment and that may, maybe that is the religion, if, as we think about it. Yeah, I think it's a modality of the internal discourse yeah. of yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, yes, you were going to... Yeah, Nick, um, I think you were looking uh, like of yourself, how to do things, how to think, what to relate to a stream of thoughts. But what if you are the measure of everything and that's enough? So if you yourself are God and you don't need to look for anything else, what if you live in that perspective that uh, you are the measure and you get the power back? and you have no doubts. I mean, you know, and you say the time sometimes finish and then you die, but nobody knows what happens when you die. But if you go like, you have the measure for what is good for yourself, and that's it. It won't be easier to have this uh, more direct relation with yourself instead of looking for something to can, I don't know, put yourself in the middle. I mean, probably it's more the influence of what I read and, and just that you are the measure of everything and not you try to adapt to, to the rest of the world because you create the world, you are an artist, so you create the room, you create the, uh, the events, you are the partner that rule the world. I mean, you create your world and you rule your world. Why would be enough for you? Solipsism? What, what's that? Like solipsism? Like, is that what she's saying? I suppose, what solipsism? Well, I mean, to some extent, and every artist does that anyway, I think. Otherwise, you know, I'd be a priest or something, or a nun. In fact, I wouldn't be a priest. You know, or I don't know. I, um, or not an artist. But I think every artist is to some degree that are, that is what you do. But you also live in the world. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you know, I don't live. I do other things. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, think I don't know. You're doing great. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's a very. I sound negative, but I mean positive. And you're doing great. I don't understand. Okay, you. Of course, you sense the person. You need to look. You have a special feeling. You can see things. You have a special sensibility, but uh, probably you're not realizing that yourself. You rule your world. You have the measure. Oh no, I do realise. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm well. I don't see really why, as a human being, we look always um, to fit uh, the other way. Up. In my opinion, it should be the other way around. Yeah, the measure what, maybe, yeah, maybe what yeah. is best for me. I, think I don't want to sound selfish or materialistic. That's not. 
Yeah, I think it's a very interesting philosophical uh, proposition that uh, that of you being the measure of all things, like Protagoras used to say, of course, that human is the measure of all things. Um, you find it sometimes also in the Renaissance, the idea that, since you were talking yeah, about that, the, the idea that you can, uh, you can assume the human as the measure of things, or more specifically you. And, the, and this is the difference, because let's say, like, I am the measure of all things. This implies, however, uh, I'm trying to get kind of uh, practical with the, with the philosophical, try to put it in practice, no? This implies, first, first of all, that I know who I am, okay? I know what I am. But if I look inside, I see, for example, that I am a couple of things at least. I am Federico, which is this object that you're looking at here, and I am the thing inside Federico that is thinks Federico's thoughts, speaks through Federico, and so on and so forth. I know that I don't, the two things don't coincide. There are two different things, like in you. And the question is that one thing, which is Federico, is a finite, well, one second, I don't know, can you hold it? Sometimes, sometimes, you, sometimes you, you, right. you, you have to get to the end, yeah. and then it makes sense. Um, there was an interesting critique to this, uh, to this notion, for example, in the, in the 1840s, 50s, by uh, an anarchist called Max Stirner, who was a German anarchist, in a book called The Ego and Its Own, who used to say that, for example, I am not a human. You know, I don't coincide with any of the labels that you can assign to me. I am the creative nothing out of which everything originates. This bit inside, the other bit, the bit is not Federico, is this creative nothing, okay, is it's unfortunately that's the problem. It's like it cannot be used as a measure because it doesn't have a particular size, doesn't have a particular form. You cannot really use it as a measuring counterpoint. In the Renaissance, Pico della Mirandola picked up on this very much. Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, kind of like philosophical superstar and almost like a rock star in a way, very very young and so on. And in the oration on the dignity of the human, it says there's this little story in which God creates all the different animals and gives to every animal a gift. And then last thought creates the human and says, oh, God, I've, I've run out of stuff. And so it tells, uh, uh, tells Adam, uh, my son, you know, I've got nothing to give you. The only thing I give you is that you will be able to be whatever you like. Okay? You don't have a nature of your own. You, have, you can enter anyone else's nature. So that thing is difficult to use as a measure. So in practical philosophical terms, I think if we try to use ourselves as a measure of things, either becomes... Uh, a form of like imprisonment in societal norms, or it becomes technically impossible because you are beyond measure. So that's the difficulty I find. So I mean, let's, let's go and let's m maybe ask some other people. Here, go. Uh, me? Uh, no, no, that's Sophia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just going to add maybe what she was talking about. So Federico mentioned earlier about philosophy as a dialogue between you and your character, and you try to guide your character throughout life. But what if I think my friend is saying is that you just totally <coughs> embrace this character and don't have a self dialogue and just just go just go for it and just just do and, and don't live in this sort this like uh, uh, distance between your character and you and or if we look at this painting it's like so we're talking about like being inside the the time versus looking for something outside but. No, I mean, no, it's not there. I, yeah. the, the, the last thing is shot. I think if we disconnect from each other, I think we are lost. And the other thing, you talked about Polaris previously, it's, uh, it's on the building in this period of time in Renaissance, they made on human measurement. So you see yourself when you see the building on a subliminal level. If you look at brutalistic buildings, you feel like lost or maybe uncomfortable or whatever. But this is because you don't see yourself or the measure that I use as it build the human body, the proportion of the distance. Sure, okay, yeah. I don't want to go too much that is very detailed, but I think when you disconnect and you look something outside and not in your side, then, then we, we stop down. Oh, but I think we're not, That's I think we're on the same page. I don't think we're in disagreement, yeah. actually. But yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, what's your perception um, of the idea of insanity in a way that you are talking a lot, you know, you are talking about Baroque as, as, as a, a kind of culture, you know, at the beginning of humanism where, you know, uh, we, we still kind of trust our visceral re relations and now we are in a, in a period where, you know, um, the, there is a certain, you know, demand for this like ultimate self-awareness uh, in which, you know, we can talk about uh, objective cosmologies and um, what do you think of the of the 
of this situation in which you know uh, the, the the very division between you know uh, um, real life and and dreaming uh, gets lost not within you know um, an effort but within the some 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 situation some subjective perception in which maybe you know one day is is different from another not because you know you want it to be but because you 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 stop distinguishing between different days and then you know this this problem. Uh, but obviously, we tried to cure it, and the whole mental health discourse tried to, you know, uh, protest against that. But uh, you know, is there some kind of epistemological um, potential? Well, in in a kind of psychosis. Uh, yeah, and and the very idea of like, you know, um, it, it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm 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 just curious because uh, throughout this conversation, you were talking about objective things and. Uh, you know, you, you've never mentioned this, you know, subjective feeling of loss and, and you know, in, in inability to, to, to be, to do anything. But, I mean, for me, just this, this work is actually a, 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 an attempt to solve that. You know, so it is a kind of solution to uh, loss and inability to do anything. And also to, I think, to be in, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know about the role of, of psychosis, though. Because, I mean, you have to be in a state of psychosis to be outside time anyway. It's like why you take drugs or drink or, you know, it's, it's being outside something, which is a kind of, I don't know. But I'm, I don't know if I'm using the word psychosis rightly. I keep looking to John because of the psychosis conversations we used to have. Well, but I think, can I just jump in something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe it maybe doesn't oh, but I'm getting loads of pink flashes in my eyes and everything. <laughs> And I'm reminded of Philip K. Dick, who is an author that we did a lot of work about together in the past. And when Phil had his 73 revel 72 revelation, it was a pink beam that was blasted oh, into yes. his brain. And it was pink, it was specifically a pink phosphorescent beam that he experienced. And that took him outside of time, and it was Baroque music that he heard streaming really? through. God, yeah. I've forgotten this. I had no, this is totally not in my memory. And Phil, this Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer in 1972, had these revelations. And began with this beam of light coming from a fish symbol, in fact, the, 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 this fish symbol was beamed out his brain and he saw it. But, so that, to come to the psychosis question, you know, the question for Phil K. Dick all his life was, was that a moment of psychosis? Did I just have a kind of psychotic rupture? Where I, or did I genuinely have a revelation that something was revealed to me, which was outside time, this vast active living intelligence system, which showed him the truth which was that this time, this world is false. And we actually, the real truth is outside somewhere, but it reveals to people only in special moments where they experience it. <coughs> and he spent his life trying to work that out. But the question of psychosis was, was immediate, that like, this was associated with abnormal psychology, uh, something that you should avoid, something that, you know, may get you put away. But it's interesting also in Doors and um, Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception, Heaven and Hell, which is, you know, like a teenage book, but actually is a very good book. Um, he talks about, I mean, it's basically a recording of him t uh, taking mescaline. Is it mescaline? Yeah. And, but he talks about visions, and there's a really amazing kind of part where he talks about the notion of visions. And it, um, <coughs> so he goes through the fact that, you know, Catholics always see the Virgin Mary, the Buddhists always see kind of what, they always see their own cultural things, but there is this aspect which is flashing lights, everyone sees that. And whatever forms they then form into, it's kind of the same thing. And then he starts talking about the, the precious gemstone industry mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we are, we have decided that these you know, rubies and diamonds and sapphires and these sparkly stones are really valuable. So he kind of, he basically, he doesn't really conclude it, but, and then he talks about sort of like all the fairy tales where goblins mine for um, emeralds and, you know, the emerald mountain and, and all these things, how they're interconnected, that there's something about visions and flashing lights and then precious gemstones, which, which are mined for, and he makes these really, really interesting links that, that somehow then these, these kind of revelatory psychosis moments are really connected to, in a sense, the economic system of the world, which I think, and so I am a kind of materialist, but I'm also interested in 
um, a sort of the psycho psychotic out of time experience. But I don't see all these things as separate. So in a sense, I think they're all materially based. Lovely. Yeah, I kind of see like the pa it's like a paradox we're kind of describing. I think these are a bit of a visual paradox because it's unclear whether the world is inside the bubble, like smoke or yeah. firmament, or actually it's what is being reflected is what's like a mirror, what the image is, or like the world is out here, it's being reflected on the bubble. Mm. So I think, like, bringing it back to the work, I think that paradox is not quite reconciling it. It's no, it isn't. I mean, it's an end, yeah, it's, I can't reconcile it. It's, in, it's impossible to reconcile it. It's yeah. also because Jennifer Higgy did um, a lecture um, on, on Monday at the schools and she was talking about female mystics and, and, uh, and mediums and, and, um, and I was thinking, yeah, I'm really interested in this stuff. And we went, I took some students actually to the, um, Anna Kay, to the College of Psychic Studies. And there's a show of mediums and art and medium. And anyway, and I was thinking, yeah, but I'm kind of more with the, with the men <laughs> who were included in the art history. Like I really, like Rothko and the more kind of materialist people. Like, but I'm not. And, and so that I, I, I am, you know, they're formal. The words are kind of formal. And they are rooted in my perception of art history. But I'm all, but then I'm also really interested in channeling. And I, I, I get quite confused. You know, my, the work is confused, basically, in my position towards it. And, you know, that's the way it is. But you're not at all confused about it, in the sense that you're absolutely certain about it. Yes, I am really certain. So, yeah, the confusion only comes from trying to bring it into discourse or into... Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. ...other ideas, but in itself there is no confusion. There is no confusion. They have an absolute function for me. And, that, and that's what I say, going back to it's the first show I've had as an artist. Mm -hmm. I didn't, and before that, I'm not sure what it was. I mean, it was sort of art, and apparently. Yeah, well, if nobody has any more questions, then... Um, we could go on, I you know. Clearly, <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe we should do it again sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.